Well, good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6, where we're going to read verses 1 to 7. Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 1. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we come to your word, which is so full of amazing truth. And so we ask through the power of the Holy Spirit, would you inform our minds, excite our hearts, challenge our lives, build our character, strengthen our resolve, and equip us to serve you in this world. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, my name is Jonathan. I'm from Ilfracombe in North Devon. And it's really brilliant to be able to preach at, or kind of at, my parents' church. I'm Pete and Pat's son, if you didn't realise. And I really appreciate the love that you as a church have shown them. And it's really kind of Stefan to give me the honour of, of preaching on this video for the morning service and to join you this evening on, on Zoom where we're going to continue through the rest of Isaiah chapter 6. But as I have this opportunity to speak at my parents' church, what kind of son would I be if I didn't take this opportunity to dig the dirt a little on my parents? Well, I'm not really going to do that, but I, I will tell you something that you may not know about them. And that is how significant it was to them when Elvis Presley died. I wonder if that's a significant event for you too. I mean, do you remember when Elvis Presley died? Well, my parents do. If you asked Peter or Pat about Elvis dying, that they could tell you the exact date, the 16th of August, 1977. Well, I guess you don't need to ask them now because you know. But, but, but the night... He died was significant for them, not because they were massive Elvis fans, I don't think they're fans at all, but because on the night he died, or at least on the night when the news came through about his death, my mum was lying on a hospital bed. Reports about the death of Elvis filtered through and, and the staff began to cry at the news but as she lay on that hospital bed, for my mum there was a more pressing matter, or more precisely a more pushing matter, because she was about to give birth to her third child. On the night that the king of rock and roll died, I was born. Now technically it was a different day, I was born on the 17th, but the news came through during that night. And so... The day and the year the king died, if we're talking about Elvis, it is very significant to my story and the story of our family. And it's with that kind of historical landmark that Isaiah opens this chapter, Isaiah chapter 6. In this case, it's relating to the, the death of, of King Uzziah. And the first words are, in the year King Uzziah died. And presumably that would give a clear context for the, the original readers who, who would have perhaps you know, nodded in understanding when, 
you know, they know exactly what he's talking about. And when he's talking about, it would be a bit like us saying in the year Elvis died or in the year John F. Kennedy died or in the year Diana died. And by starting off in this way, Isaiah is grounding what follows in reality. The division he records is not a vague dream, but something that happened at a specific time. And the reality of this vision is important because it is something that must have totally transformed Isaiah's life and given him such a magnified understanding of God and who he is. See, by the grace of God, Isaiah was given this magnificent vision of God. And this morning, I want to ask you, how big is your vision of God? How big is your vision of God? God. This morning we're going to look at these first seven verses of this chapter and, and this evening, God willing, we'll look at the second half. And as we look at these first seven verses this morning, we're going to consider how in this vision of God, Isaiah saw firstly the glorious holiness of God, secondly the terrifying holiness of God, and thirdly the gracious holiness of God. So that's where we're going, but we're starting with the glorious holiness of God. Verses 1 to 3, the glorious holiness of God. And as Isaiah starts saying what happened in the year King Uzziah died, he immediately hits us with, with an incredible statement. He says, in the year King, King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, isn't that an incredible thing? I mean, if you just think about really what he is saying, that he saw the Lord to see God who is spirit, God who, who, according to Jesus, no one has seen. And yet Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. So, so what did he see? And here's where it gets even more interesting, because actually in all of the descriptions that follow in this chapter, Isaiah doesn't describe God himself. Rather, he focuses all the descriptions on everything that's around God. So what did he see? Or did he see something of God's glory like Moses did? Or did he say, did he see something else? We may be given the answer in the New Testament because in, in John chapter 12, we read that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So, so is that what's happening here in Isaiah 6? The glory of Jesus? Well, maybe, but, but even then, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what he means. But what we can be sure about is that in some way Isaiah meaningfully saw God. And as he describes just some of what he saw, we are pointed towards a truly awesome God. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, Isaiah says. God is there on a throne, underlining his, his kingship, his sovereign authority above all things. King Uzziah may be dead, but here is a king who, who lives forever. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. His throne is above all other thrones. His, his power is above all powers. He is revered more than all others. High and exalted is the Lord. And the train of his robe filled the temple, Isaiah continues. The train of his, his robe, it's, it's an interesting image, isn't it? Imagine the train on a wedding dress, except you know, more magnificent and, and much, much bigger. You can hardly visualize what this means, that it fills the temple, except that it's something of great splendor. And then we get to, to verse 2, and we meet the seraphs. Verse 2, above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Now, this is the only place in the Bible that we read uh, about angels that are called seraphs. They may be the same or they may be different from other angels that we read about. But the word seraphs literally means burning ones, which perhaps gives us a clue about what they looked like burning ones. Creatures that looked like they were burning. And, and, and we don't know whether that would be from themselves or, or whether they were reflecting the glory of the Lord. We're not told that, but we are told about their wings. And they each have six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, Isaiah says. 
So, so here are, are sinless heavenly beings and yet even they are covering their faces when near to the throne of God because they will not or perhaps even cannot look upon the glory of God. So great is that glory. And then we read with two they covered their feet. And with that it's probably implied that much of their bodies were covered and so there they are around the Lord God and, and they are hiding themselves. Impressive looking creatures though they may be, the glory belongs only to God. Isaiah then sees that with their last two wings they are flying. They have the freedom to go anywhere but where are they? They're staying near the throne, obedient and ready to serve. And when you take in all these things that Isaiah says about the seraphs, the incredible thing is it, it all points to the glory of God. And it's the same when it comes to what the seraphs are saying. Verse 3, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, they are saying. Holy is the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Holy is he. Now the word holy is one of those words which is quite hard to define. The meaning of the word is something like set apart. But that only properly makes sense when we're talking about the things of the world that have been made holy. Like, like the ground Moses stood on by the burning bush was holy. It had been set apart from the rest of the world as special. And that's the same for all of the things of this world that are described as holy, including ourselves. If you are, if you or I are holy, it is because we are set apart from the world. But what about when it comes to talking about God himself as holy? We cannot really say that God is set apart in the same way. If anything, it's the other way around. We are set apart from him. It is he who is at the centre of all things. It's he who is at the heart of everything. He is all in all. He's the author of all things. He's, he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. God is the absolute and all things derive their existence and identity from him. He's not set apart from us so much as we are departed from him. God is the centre, he is the absolute. So, so what do we mean by holy? Well, it's God's goodness, God's being, God's essence. It's what God is. The American pastor John Piper describes the word holy as being the end of the world in our language to describe God. It's as far as we can get. How can language with, with its limitations fully describe the one who is infinite? It cannot, but holy, suggests Piper, is as far as we can get in our attempts to describe God. But here in Isaiah, well, we have this great word to describe God, but it's not given once, it's not given twice, but three times it is expressed to underline how significant it is. Holy, holy, holy. They were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Throughout the world, the holiness and wonder of God is evident in the glory of God. His glory is seen in creation and his glory is seen in his created beings. His glory is so often missed, even by his teachers, his children like us. We so often miss it, but his glory is, is so clearly, evidently present throughout the earth. Oh, to appreciate that glory more. What a picture of God is given here to Isaiah. What a wonderful vision that he could see and that we can read about here in God's word. You see, it isn't just Isaiah who has this incredible privilege. We get to read about it. We get to, to see through God's word. This amazing, amazing vision of, of God. But, but how big is your vision of God? How great is he in your estimation? Have you grasped something more of his excellence? 
Do you say holy, holy, holy and become frustrated that you, you cannot say more? Isaiah's vision of God increased on that day in the year King Uzziah died. He did not see or understand or come to know God completely. No, no one can know God completely. He's infinite. But he did come to know God more. His vision of God increased. So firstly, we see the glorious holiness of God. And secondly, we see the terrifying holiness of God. Verses 4 and 5, the terrifying holiness of God. I wonder if you've ever been in the situation where you suddenly feel out of your depth. I'm sure we all have at some stage, suddenly overwhelmed by the realisation that you have no way of controlling what's happening. Well, that's what happens to Isaiah in verse 5. He realises he's out of his depth. And verse 4, it seems, is the point where it all catches up with him as, as he realises the impact of what he's seeing. Verse 4, at the sound of their voices... The doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, back in verse 1, Isaiah had stated that he had seen the Lord, but suddenly the doorways were shaking as if to keep him out, and the temple was filled with smoke, obscuring his vision. And Isaiah realises that what he's seen is too great to bear. What he's seen is liable to destroy him. He realises he's in danger and he is terrified. Verse 5. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Any pretense is impossible. Isaiah cannot claim any goodness in the presence of such holiness and purity. Even though of all his people, Isaiah may well have been one of the most upright men. Compared with others from his corrupt nation, Isaiah was probably a rare exception. But here he was with God and there was no escaping his inadequacy. There was no hiding his own sinfulness. He could have been a better man than any. I mean, if he'd compared himself to other people, he may have looked pretty good. Now, from our house, we can see hills which sometimes have sheep on them. And we can see those sheep clearly because compared to the green grass, they look incredibly white. But on the rare occasions when it snows in Ilfracu, if we were to see sheep on the hills then, they would still stand out, but not because they're so white, but because compared to the snow, their whiteness would be dull and dirty. And Isaiah, maybe compared to other people, and maybe you and I, maybe compared to some people, some the very worst people in this world, maybe. Maybe would see, be seen as, as white and pure. Maybe Isaiah would be seen as white and pure in comparison to other people. But when compared to the absolute purity of God, Isaiah's natural rottenness was exposed and he is rightly filled with fear. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty, in this vision of God, in his, in his encounter with the Holy One, Isaiah saw more than ever his own failings and his people's failings and his complete impurity before God. He saw that he was not fit to be in God's presence. He recognised that, that what he deserved was to be consumed by God's righteousness. His vision of God grew, but as it did, so did his awareness of his sinfulness. And he was terrified. Now, now the holiness of God is sometimes compared to a fire. And if we imagine fire, I'm sure we often think about something small and under control, like, like the fire in, 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 in a lounge in a fireplace or, or a little campfire, maybe. And maybe that's how Isaiah had previously thought about God's holiness. But 
there on this day as he stood before God, he realized that here was a fire that he could not control. This was a a raging blaze completely out of his control. This was no campfire. This was more like a, a forest fire. The kind of fire where the only options are run or be destroyed. Um, a, a friend of ours used to live in Australia and he, he recalls a time when he was um, he was in the middle of a, a, a forest fire trying to escape in his car and he was driving along this very straight road the, the, the bush beside him, either side of him. And the fire was kind of going beyond him, in front of him. But he just kept going as fast as he could because he knew he just needed to get out of there. And, you know, by the grace of God, he, he, he did escape and he did get out of it. But what a frightening experience that would have been. And when we think about the holiness of God, we need to realize how serious we should take it. God's holiness is more terrifying than any bush or forest fire surrounding us. We truly need the kind of vision of God that Isaiah had in this chapter because so easily we have an inadequate view, not just of God's holiness, but our sin. We so easily do not regard sin with the kind of horror that filled Isaiah. I'm sure we are horrified by many sins. I mean, who cannot be anything but horrified by murder and violence and oppression? But are we, are we horrified by all sin? Are you horrified by all of your sin? Even those precious ones, those secret sins, those ones that are a stumbling block again and again. Are, are you truly horrified by their evil? I'm a man of unclean lips, says Isaiah. And we know where he's coming from, don't we? Because it's so easy to sin with our lips, to let something slip out that shouldn't have been said. To, to boast, to gossip, to slander, to hide the truth. Ah. But how do you regard those slips of the tongue that you make? Are you truly horrified by their wickedness? Maybe compared to other people, we come out all right. But God is the absolute standard by which we must compare ourselves morally. And the reality is every time we fail, Paul writes that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the more Christ-like we become, the more we realise that. The closer to God we are walking, the more we understand how inadequate we are. So what is your attitude towards sin? How do you feel about your own sinfulness? Do you name yourself with Paul as the chief of sinners? Or how we need an increased vision of God. That we might have a decreased vision of ourselves, where God is more and I am less, humble before God, a wretched sinner who hates his sin before a God of all holiness. So firstly, we see the glorious holiness of God. Secondly, we see the terrifying holiness of God. And thirdly, we see the gracious holiness of God. Verses 6 and 7, the gracious holiness of God. From verse 6. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah, having identified his shortcomings, his impurity and his sinfulness, is purified. He, he's cleansed. His guilt is taken away. His, his sin atoned for. But notice who does it. Well, it's, it's one of the seraphs. One of the servants of God who, who's not just acting on his own judgment. No, he, he's responding to the call of God. This work is all the initiative of God, isn't it? God is directing things. It's God's work and it is an effective work. Verse 7, with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. 
Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The moment Isaiah is touched, his guilt has been taken away and his sin atoned for. He is purified in an instant. He is made right. And now he can stand before God. Now he can be in his presence because God has made himself or made Isaiah right in his presence. He is atoned for his sin. The word atoned or atonement has that idea of being made with God, um, sorry, made, being made right with God or being made one with him. The word atonement, at one being one, being right with God. And that's what happened to Isaiah. He's been made right with God. God has purified him and he's been clothed in God's righteousness. It's like God has put Isaiah in protective clothing so that he can exist in the heart of that forest fire. Where he would have fallen, Isaiah now stands. He has been made right with God. But the way God has cleansed Isaiah is, is important as well. Look back, to, look, look back at verse 6. It, it may seem a bit odd that it's a piece of coal that does the job, but, but see where the coal is taken from. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. Now, the altar is the place of sacrifice, isn't it? And in Old Testament times, this especially meant animal sacrifices. And these were given because we read in, in Leviticus 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. This is the, uh, for, for it is by, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So Isaiah has been to told that his sin is atoned for when he's been touched on his lips by that coal that's come from the altar. The altar, which is the place in Leviticus 17 where atonement is made, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. We're atoned, we're made right with God through the shedding of blood on the altar. Now, of course, the Old, Old Testament sacrifices, they weren't the end they look forward to a greater sacrifice, don't they? That they look forward to the ultimate sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, whose, whose blood atones for the sin of all who trusted in him. Everyone who trusts in him has their sin atoned by that blood of Jesus. And because of that, we don't need to continue making sacrifices anymore because the sacrifice of Jesus was a, a once for all sacrifice. And, and if you've trusted in Christ, your sins have been atoned for. The penalty for your sins has been taken away, paid for by Jesus. But this morning, I must ask you, have your sins been atoned for? Has your guilt been taken away? Have you been made right with God? Because if you haven't, you have a great need this morning, a need for a saviour to take the punishment for your sins. But like Isaiah, if you trust God... If you confess your sins like Isaiah did, if you put your trust in the Saviour, he will make you right with God. See, the awesome vis vision that, that Isaiah saw confirmed to him what he deserved. Woe is me, he says. And we too deserve to bear the wrath of a just and holy God. And yet God, by his grace, has made a way for us to be reconciled to him, a way for us to be friends with the almighty God. In C.S. Lewis's most famous book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Mr. Beaver is asked by Lucy whether Aslan the Lion is safe. And you've probably heard this quote so many times, but, but the reply is such a helpful way of understanding God. So is Aslan the Lion safe, wonders Lucy? Well, here's the answer. Safe? said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And the God of Scripture 
is not safe, but he is good. He is gracious. And even though he is so holy, and even though we are so sinful, he has made a way by which we can be made right with him by the person of Jesus Christ. So if you've not been made right with God, I would urge you, I would beg you, confess your sins to God, turn with thanksgiving to Christ and make him your Lord and King. And like Isaiah, you will be able to stand before God. And that's the confidence every Christian can have. We've been made right with God. Our sins have been paid for, which means that we can stand before God without terror as those who have been purified. Oh yes, yes, we continue to sin in this life and we must hate that sin more and more and carry on confessing our sins to God. But we can still trust in Christ completely for our salvation. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, yes, we trip up. Yes, we make mistakes. But what a wonderful Word of assurance from Paul there in Romans 8. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That the same purifying power that, that touched the lips of Isaiah, who confessed that he was a man of unclean lips, that, that same purifying power has touched our greatest need. If you have trusted in Christ, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your own rottenness. Instead, he looks at you and sees what you are clothed in, that protective clothing. He sees the righteousness of Christ. What a great God we serve. How wonderful he is. But may I ask you again, how big is your vision of God? We need that ever increasing understanding of the holiness of God, don't we? And we need that ever increasing understanding of the horror of sin. And as that vision of God increases, we shall surely appreciate more and more how great the grace of God is. What amazing grace. That he should save a sinful wretch like me. And when we think of the price that was paid to make it happen, the death of Jesus, we should be staggered at this grace. We have a holy God, we have a terrifying God, certainly terrifying for the sinner. And we have such a gracious God. So as we draw to a close, let me ask the question again, how big is your vision of God? Because the answer to that question cuts to the core of every part of our lives. How big is your vision of God? Because if we know God more, if we love him more, if we appreciate his holiness more, we will be more and more devoted to that great God. And our lives will be more and more drenched with our joy and our pleasure in knowing him and serving him. And that's my prayer for us this morning, that our hearts will be more full of joy and more full of a desire to serve the living God as we appreciate more than ever the holiness of God. And so if you've gained a better understanding of this passage, that will be good as well. But my, my big desire is this. And I believe God's desire is this as well, that as we've looked at this passage, that our vision of God may have grown, that as we've reflected on God being gloriously holy, about him being terrifying in his holiness, and about him being gracious in his holiness. Oh, I trust that your affection for God may have been stirred, that your love for him may have grown, that your amazement at him may have increased, and that your vision of God may have become larger. And that's what we need, isn't it? An increased vision of God, so that our lives may be more and more devoted to him. That awesome, mighty, authoritative, resplendent, omnipotent, sovereign, merciful, gracious, glorious, and holy, holy, holy. Lord Almighty. Let us come to that Lord in prayer. Oh, Father God, we do pray that you will help our vision of you and who you are and everything about you grow. May it grow greatly, we pray. That we may be able to speak with those seraphs, those words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth 
is full of his glory. May we recognize that glory more and more. And may your holiness be more evident in our lives, evident in our character, evident in our eagerness to serve, and evident as we reflect the beautiful person of Jesus in every aspect of our lives. We pray this for your glory. Amen.